Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, we are wrapping up some stories we've been following this season. We get a sneak peek of the Myriad Gardens Crystal Bridge as they are about to have their grand opening. Shelly Mitchell shows us how to turn our gourds into birdhouses. I'll harvest our ketchup and fries plant. And finally, we head to Vertigris as they bring in the pecan harvest. This might not look familiar, but we are actually right back here at Myriad Garden's new Crystal Bridge that's going to be opening soon. And joining me today is Maureen Heffernan, who is the CEO of Myriad Gardens. Maureen, thanks so much for giving us a sneak peek well, a little bit. thanks for bit. following our project over these almost a year, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's been quite a process. It's and this tree fun. has survived it all. I so. know, we've survived it, the tree has <laughs> survived it. And, and we're so excited to be almost done. Yeah, so obviously we've got some plants coming in. I know there's still some more little tweaks to do before the grand opening, but let's talk about what you've got done so far. We've got lots of little tweaks, but uh, the, the big things are all in place. So you can see it's completely different yes. from the, the previous one. So the thing I think people will notice, first of all, is that there's an open canopy. Before we closed, it was truly like a rainforest right. in here. So. It's going to take some time to grow back, but in the meantime, there's a lot of light in here. You can see the beautiful architecture. So, um, but we have planted, we'll probably have as many, if not a little bit more plants themselves and before we close. Okay. And, and you still have the dry and the wet side. We have the dry it, yeah. side over here on the north and the rest of it is all tropical type plants. Right. Right. And then I, you group the plants, is that right? Has yeah. Among, among the many, changes we've made is we thought about how do we tell stories better? How do we interpret the collection better? And so our director of horticulture, Nate Shane, um, suggested we group things uh, that have some similarities. Okay. Um, so when you're there, you can really talk about a group of things and um, learn more about them. So for instance, behind your shoulder here, we have mangoes and avocados and pineapples and bananas. So a lot of things like that are in this section. And behind me, I think there's an olive tree, there's coffee beans, so kind of commodity type things. Okay. And what you don't see today here, but one of the things that we have to add back in is all of our new interpretations. So we're really excited about how our new interpretation, everything from plant labels for individual plants up to um, telling stories, interpretation, um, will all be installed here. So it will be a much richer experience for all ages to come through. You can learn as little as you want or as much as you want. We have different levels right. of uh, information. So that'll all be still to come. So there's a little bit of a low roar in the background that we mm -hmm. all, there's always water in here. And mm -hmm. there still is a nice, beautiful, big waterfall behind us. Well, that was a tradition we kept. When you come in, you hear water. Yes. <laughs> the different kind of sound. But yes, that's our new waterfall, which is really a beautiful piece. It's a big focal point. And again, it's, it's very new, the plantings on either side of it, but they'll start to grow over and overhang and, right. and soften it. But it's a wonderful feature to have. In the rainforest, you have to have water. <laughs> Waterfalls, this is kind of a stylistic um, kind of modern approach to that. And you sort of balanced it with water now on the other end too. Almost we did. like an oasis You're right. in the it's, desert. It's kind of, you know, moving water and still water. Right. So we kind of have the yin and yang of waters here. But the reflecting pool is really beautiful. We've got some papyrus growing in there, water lilies. And above it, we'll be hanging these three large um, flower balls, which will change with different seasons. So their reflection as well as the, the sky and uh, the architecture is all reflected in the pool, so okay. 
um, that's a nice feature that we've added. And I know you've changed the the walkway. There's a gift shop. Uh, you've got an art gallery mm -hmm. now out front that's kind of themed with the grand opening. Mm -hmm. um, give us a little bit of a teaser about that grand opening and when it is. Well, it opens to the public on November 18th. And then we'll be open seven days a week, Monday through Saturday, nine to five. And then on Sundays, 11 to six. Okay. Starting Black Friday and then all through December, we'll have extended hours on Friday and Saturday evenings until eight. So people can come out and tour the new Crystal Bridge or shop in the gift shop during the holiday season. So even though that looks almost complete, there's still some more to do, but it will be ready to go for grand opening. Yeah, I look at here and I see everything that's missing <laughs> and how much uh, more canopy it will feel. We'll be putting in a lot of containers through here with plantings and up by the waterfall. Um, all the interpretations, seating, benches. We also have a new discovery room. It's not a big space, but it's, it was an unused space between the elevator and our second level mm -hmm. entrance into the conservatory. So we've turned it into a really family friendly, kid friendly room that has some really wonderful interpretation and graphics showing how plants and insects work together to help each other uh, and strategies that they both have to survive. And so that will be opening too. And it's really colorful and fun. And it's a good place to either start your visit or end your visit. And we'll have little activities for kids to do uh, when they visit in the Discovery Room. Well, thank you, Maureen, for sharing this sneak peek with us. Well, thanks for covering this project and hope you'll continue to cover it. Absolutely. Okay. If you grew birdhouse gourds this summer and you're wondering what to do with them now that they've dried and they're a nice brown color, you've come to the right place. The first thing you're want, gonna wanna do is to take your gourds and you're gonna wanna soak them in bleach water for about 30 minutes. This is because all these little moldy spots have spores and you don't wanna be breathing those as you work with your gourd. Now, sometimes when you pull the gourds out, they have like a little flakiness to their outer skin and you're gonna to wanna to get that off. And there's several ways you can do that. One way you can do it is to use steel wool. And all you have to do is rub it a little bit and you'll see that that outer skin just comes off. If you don't wanna mess with steel wool, you can also use a sanding block and you can also get some of the flakiness off with that. Or if you've grown some loofah gourds, you can use them to help you clean your birdhouse gourds. So once you finish sanding off your gourd, it'll be really smooth all over. And if you notice, some gourds have a lot of black spots and that's mold. And that usually comes with drying your gourds indoors. If you dry your gourds outdoors, the rain and stuff will wash off the mold so they won't do this. But so you have a choice there. If you want gourds that have a lot of little black dots, then you can just cure them indoors. All right, so after we get it smooth, now it's time to poke some holes in it for your little hanger for your birdhouse and also a little hole for the birds to go in and out. So I just used a small bit, just enough to get some wire through. And I'm just gonna go on either side. All right, so I got just enough that I can stick some wire through now, when you go to put the uh, bird hole in, first you have to decide what kind of bird you want. The smallest hole you want to put in there is an inch. That's for like wrens. If you go up to like one and a half and two inches, then you're getting into like cardinals and stuff. So the, another thing you need to know is when the gourd is shaped like this, you want to put the bird the hole kind of away from this so the water doesn't just pour in whenever it rains. So I just put a starter hole in here and then I'm going to use a paring knife. You could use a pocket knife and you're going to make the hole bigger. And you're just going to keep making the hole bigger until it's the size you want. Now, if you have a really thin shelled gourd, it might break. So you're going to have to be careful doing this. So after you have the hole for the birds to come in and you've got the holes to hang it from, you need to put a piece of wire through it. If you put twine or something, it's going to degrade fast. So I always use wire. 
All right. And then you just make it into a little loop. And then you have your gourd. And before you're completely finished, you need to remember to put drainage holes in the bottom of the gourd so that the birds won't get soaked from whatever water dips in. Couple's good enough. And there you have your gourd birdhouse. As the weather starts to cool off, it's time to start harvesting those remaining warm season vegetables. And I wanted to revisit one of the plants that we kind of mentioned earlier in the season that was a little bit of a novelty that we purchased um, and planted here in our gardens. And that is the ketchup and fries, um, which is a hybrid plant that has tomatoes grafted on to potatoes down below. So you can see that they grew quite well. Of course, they don't look as good where at the end of the season, things are starting to shut down, but all season long, we've been nibbling on some of these um, cherry, kind of grape-sized tomatoes. They've been a nice little snack here in the garden. Um, and so on the tomato side of it, we've enjoyed it. Now, we don't know what's going on underneath, but wanted to kind of talk to you about some of the things that um, is sort of how you go about harvesting those potatoes at this point. And what's recommended is that we go ahead and cut off the tomato part and that sort of signals to the potato down below that it's time to start kind of uh, wrapping up that process and sort of harden off those potatoes in order to be harvested. And so you'll notice on tomatoes, um, I will mention I kind of maybe did something wrong. I'm acknowledging it, but typically when you're planting something grafted you don't plant the graft down in the ground and we found out later that this actually is recommended that you do plant the graft union down below the ground so that the tomato actually will root also so that you get a more vigorous tomato um, and you'll notice that our, our potato actually started growing as well and they recommend that you go ahead and leave that as well so you almost got both plants still growing even though they're on one stem I will say it's kind of unique that the graft union, it, it worked on all three of our plants. Um, however, the diameter is still very different, which is unique to see. So you can obviously see where that graft union is. Now, because we didn't bury that graft, it's kind of mentioned that we might not get as many potatoes as we normally would. So we'll find out. What it's recommended to do at this point is to go ahead and cut um, our tomato graft off. And so we're gonna do that. And um, we'll go ahead and take our tomatoes um, plant in. I've gotta take some of this uh, trellising off of it, but we'll take those in, harvest what we can get, and maybe see if some of these green ones will ripen up for us. And then revisit our potatoes in about 10 days um, as they kind of shut down and we will see how many we have to harvest. So it's been 10 days since we cut the tomato part of our ketchup and fries plant off. And so now we've given our potatoes a little bit of time. And so it's time to start digging them and see what we've got. Now, typically we plant potatoes usually in March and then harvest those about in June. So they usually need about a hundred days in order to develop. You can, however, plant potatoes in mid-August. The problem is when you're looking at uh, planting in the fall, we never know when our Oklahoma winters are gonna show up. So getting those 100 days to develop our fall potatoes is kind of iffy sometimes. Now these potatoes, we, we planted this plant in April, as soon as we could plant it um, in the spring, um, like any of your tomato plants. And so these potatoes have been growing for a long period of time. However, uh, you know, we are in kind of an elevated table, so kind of limited on root space. So we'll have to see what we've got in here. So as you can see, it did actually produce some potatoes. However, I think it produced a little more ketchup than it did fries on our grafted plant. 
So while it is a little bit more of a novelty, you know, I think it's fun to try, but probably not going to be the solution to increase your production per square footage. So again, a fun grafted plant of growing tomatoes and potatoes on the same plant if you want to give it a try. It's been really dry in Oklahoma this past year. In fact, 100% of the state is currently under some level of drought as determined by the USDA. Over the past 12 months, only one month came in ahead of schedule or ahead of normal if we look at the long-term average of rainfall for Oklahoma, and that would be the month of May. The other 11 or 12 months came in well below normal. In fact, the last three months were several inches from where we expected it to be for that time of year. Now that we've moved into fall, we have started to pick up a few rains here and there, although it's not been statewide, only parts of the state. Even though we received a couple of inches of rain lately, we're still going to be behind for the month and when you look at that cumulative effect of 11 or 12 months of behind normal rainfall, we have a lot of ground to make up going forward. We measure rainfall at the Oklahoma Mesonet stations across the state with what's referred to as a tipping rain gauge. It's a very accurate rain gauge that doesn't require somebody to actually be there to dump out the moisture when it does uh, rain, it is simply a seesaw, water's collected at the top, and it tips like a seesaw whenever one one hundredth of an inch of rain is collected into the bucket. So we are accurate down to the level of one one hundredth of an inch. Now there's actually two rain gauges at every mesonet site in case one of them goes bad. We have a backup because rainfall is probably the most important weather parameter that we measure for the state of Oklahoma. As that rainfall penetrates into the ground, we're able to pick it up on soil moisture probes. We have them under a sod cover, and we also have soil probes underneath a chemically treated bare soil that would simulate a tilled garden or a tilled field situation. These probes are able to determine soil temperature and soil moisture at the same time. We put it into two different products to determine soil moisture. One of them is called a fractional water index, and it's a simple uh, scale that goes from zero to one, where zero would be as dry as this sensor can read. On the other end of that scale is 1.0, or as wet as this sensor can read at that particular depth, the other method that we use to determine or to illustrate soil moisture in the soil is something called plant available water. Even though there is moisture in the soil at all times, it can get to a level to where plants can't absorb it through their root systems anymore. That portion of water that is available to the plant is called plant available water. The stress that we get from, from drought stress on plants is often seen years down the road. And we have a lot of ground to make up to get our soil moisture levels back uh, to full levels in the soil profile from where we would like to be this time of year. To access our weather data, you can always uh, look at our website at mesonet.org or you can obtain an app for any smartphone available at the Apple Store or Google Play Store. It's autumn and there's more than just leaves falling out of the trees. Today we are at Verdigris, Oklahoma and joining me is Mike Spradling and we are at Flying G 
pecan farm and let's talk about pecan harvest, right? Well, sure. It just started it you just know, a couple of weeks ago and we're out here today. We're harvesting varieties. We're in the Kansas and the Pawnee variety. Okay. We're very fortunate though that uh, these are early varieties and they split early because as you well know, about two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, it was 22 degrees in this orchard, right. which means that if the shuck was not split on these pecans, there's a good chance it wouldn't split and we could have lost all those. Okay. So we've been very fortunate in that respect. But we have two issues really for pecan production this year for Oklahoma growers. First of all, it started with a drought, mm -hmm. which we had all summer long, and then it came with early freeze. And so both of those things can affect the production for Oklahoma growers. So it's been a little bit of a rough year for the pecan crop this season, but you are getting some out of your cultivars here. Tell me a little bit about that process for harvesting. Well, of course, we're in the inline orchard here, mm -hmm. and that's the difference between a grove. We have a grove that's got the native pecans. The natives, and, and they're, not, they're not they're in not organized They're not in line, line no. Right? God, okay. God planted those, yes. I planted these. So. <laughs> But anyway, so we have inline harvesting operation. So we come in with a self-propelled shaker that shakes the rows of trees. Then after that, we come in with a sweeper and the sweeper is putting them all in a windrow, just like you would in hay. Mm -hmm. And then they're, they're blowing the nuts to the other aisle on the other side. So when the sweeper comes up, it's sweeping clean on both sides. So there's no nuts in the dirt portion of this row. Okay. After that, we have a big, especially in this time of year when the leaves are really dropping, we have a large uh, windrow of leaves. So we bring a leaf back over the top of that, which sucks the leaves off, leaves the pecans on the ground. And then the big inline harvesters, which you've seen earlier, comes in and picks those pecans all up. After that point, then we'll put them into a cart that takes them to the pre-cleaner. And the pre-cleaner does just as it says, it pre-cleans the pecans before we take them to the ranch to actually do the final cleaning process. Okay. And I know there's a lot of different ways. Inline is your chosen method here. Um, what are some of the benefits of that? Because I imagine you're probably driving over some of your harvest. Is that the case or no? Well, with a pull type harvester, that is the case. Once okay. you shake that row, your first pass down since the harvester is offset, the first pass you have ground pecans all over the ground. Well, the tractor is initially going to have to go down the row, right. which is going to be running over pecans until you get that first pass. So once the pecans have been picked up by that harvester, then the next time they come around, because it's only picking up four feet wide, so the next time it comes around, then it, the tractor drives where it's been harvested and it's picking up nuts then from there. Well, so that's the thing with a with a pull type harvester. The inline, though, everything's swept into a windrow so you don't run over nuts in any portion of the harvest. And there's some clever technology even on that shaker to get the pecan nuts around. Well, there's some clever technology, <laughs> but there's some very expensive technology as well. <laughs> Always in agriculture, right? That's right. So tell me a little bit about the um, pre-cleaning, what that process is, and then they go into super sacks, is that? Well, we'll do the pre-cleaner here. And the reason we do that, because the ranch operation is 35 miles from the orchard. Okay. So we don't want to haul a, a lot of debris that's that the harvester picks up as well. So we take them to the pre-cleaner. It takes more leaves out, takes more sticks out, puts the pecans then up into a trailer that we take back. And then when we get to the ranch, then they go through a real sophisticated clean operation. I hear something that keeps firing off in the background. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, those are called crow cannons. Okay. And they're, they're propane fired. And of course, they're, we have the electronic, you talk about technology, even in crow cannons now, <laughs> we have computers in those uh, chips that are in those crow cannons. But it will fire based upon how we program it either how many times it will or how frequently it does. Mm -hmm. But what that does is to give crows an idea that there's a sh somebody shooting at them. Okay. Of course, again, crows are very smart. So you can't just set them and walk off and forget about it because they'll learn that that sound that doesn't mean any, well, it doesn't mean anything because no one's shooting at them. Oh. So every once in a while you need hunters out here that actually will associate the sound and lead oh, okay. to the crow so they when they hear that, Better get out of here, somebody's shooting at me. Because that is a detriment to your crop that you've got setting out crows, here, right? Crows yeah. get 45 pounds of pecans a piece and squirrels get 50. Wow. So yeah, a wildlife is an issue that the growers have to deal with. Well, Mike, thank you so much for sharing this process with us. Well, you're quite welcome. I tell you all, the growers of Oklahoma would ask consumers one thing. Mm -hmm. We'd like to challenge them during the holiday season to not only utilize pecans in the traditional pecan pie, right. but put it in one additional dish during the holiday season. I think it would make a great addition to any dish. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Yes, ma'am.
There are a lot of great horticulture activities this time of year. Be sure and consider some of these events in the weeks ahead. Join us next week as we conclude our 2022 Oklahoma gardening season and give you a sneak peek of what's to come next year. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure to visit our website at oklahomagardening.okstate.edu. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. Tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater gem. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Tulsa Garden Center at Woodward Park, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, Smart Pot, and the Tulsa Garden Club.